Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jay, and what I got for you today is the Canon R8 Beginner's Guide. Now, I'm gonna go over everything you need to know for the new Canon R8. So below the video, I will have timestamps set up so you can skip ahead or go back or come back at a later time, for example, um, because there's so much information to cover with this camera. It's extremely powerful. And uh, I'm, I wanna be very thorough in this beginner's guide, so I'm gonna take my time explaining things. So I'm making this video for those that are really new to cameras primarily. So this might be a little bit too simplistic for you if you have a lot of experience with cameras and stuff like that. So for you guys, you could just skip ahead using the timestamps or whatever. But for those that don't know, like you just got this camera, it's your first camera, and you invested in this awesome full frame R8, you know, this video is optimized for you. I'm expecting you to know nothing, and I will just walk you through how to use this thing from start to finish. Now, if you're in a rush and you just wanna get out going as fast as possible with the Canon R8, I also created a quick start guide. You can check that out. I have it linked up here. I also have it linked below in the description area, and that will get you up and running in about 10 minutes. This video is probably gonna be like an hour and a half, maybe longer, just to give you a quick overview of what this video is gonna be like. I'm gonna go over the camera body first. I'm gonna show you how to mount the lens, put the battery in, all that type of stuff. Then I'm gonna turn the camera on, show you a couple of things really quick in the menu system and you know overview of the camera. Then I'm gonna go into the lab scene behind me and live demonstrate how the camera works using various modes, autofocus, all sorts of stuff like that. So you can actually see the camera working in an actual environment. And it'll really help like cement the concepts that I'm trying to explain to you when you actually see me using the camera live. So that is how this is gonna work. And of course, if you guys have questions below the video in the comments area, feel free to ask questions and I'll try my best to help you out. So, all right. Let's get right into it. All right, so for starters, this is the kit that I got. So I got the Canon R8 with the 24 to 50 millimeter kit lens, as you can see here. Now there's also a neck strap here. I'm not gonna put the neck strap on right now, but I do highly recommend putting the neck strap on. Um, I'm not gonna do it because I need to move the camera around. It's gonna be in the lab doing testing and I just don't want the cord getting in the way. But for regular use, guys, if you're going out in the field, you're gonna wanna put this on. Basically, it just weaves through these two strap holes and then you'll be able to you know, hang the camera on your neck and stuff so you don't have to worry about dropping it you know, or holding it awkwardly. You can just put it on your neck and then have hands free and stuff. So make sure you take the time to put the neck strap on. I apologize, I'm not putting that on right now. So next thing we're gonna to wanna to do, we're gonna to wanna to make sure the battery is charged. So we have the battery right here and it just goes into the charger like so. On the bottom of the charger, it has a little wall outlet that swivels out. So when you plug it in, the battery is gonna charge and this is the charging light. When charging is complete, you will see this full light light up green. So once the battery is fully charged, we can put it into the bottom of the camera. And as you can see here, we have this little door. You just gotta pull this lever over and the battery goes in. And the battery goes in like this from this perspective. Just slide it in there and it has this little gray lock lever right here that you can pop out, and that will allow you to grab the battery and take it out. All right, so in addition to the battery here, you have this little door, this little flap, and this peels away like so. That gives you room for the cord when you use a dummy battery. Now, Canon makes a dummy battery solution where it goes to like an AC wall outlet. That's what this little door is for. So I'll have that part number linked up. And that is a really good solution if you're filming in the studio for extended periods of time and this battery isn't that good. It only lasts like an hour or so. So you can get this dummy battery solution for extended uh, studio recording in particular. So I would highly recommend checking out that accessory. There's also cheaper ones on Amazon, but you know, they're aftermarket. So uh, I would recommend going with the Canon version. It is more money, but it's made by Canon, you know? So the next thing we wanna do is put the memory card in and this camera does have a UHS-2 card slot. So that means you can put a fast memory card in like this one here. Now, I use SanDisk and ProGrade cards. I will have them linked below. It goes right here and it goes into this slot right there. That is the SD card slot and then it clicks down. And to take it out, you can just click it and it'll pop out and then you can grab it. And then the door just closes and it automatically locks. Now you have a quarter thread here for tripod mount plates or a mini tripod, for example. Now on the side of the camera, you have a bunch of ports here. And what I wanna show you, there's a remote control that you can get for this camera. I'll, have, I'll put that part number up here so you can get that if you want. That's for the remote. 
which is great for when you don't want to touch the camera and you want to take photos and start recording and things like that. Underneath here you have the micro HDMI and you also have a USB-C charging port. And also that port is used for transferring photos and videos off the camera. But I just want to show you when you plug in a USB-C cable, uh, now this is like a PD power source, which is a high wattage power source. So as you can see, this green light is lit, letting you know that the battery is currently charging. Now, when you turn the camera on, this light will go out. So you can see the battery indicator on the top there, how it's grayed out. That's because I have the power source in there. So the camera is being powered by the USB power source. Um, you do have to have the battery in the camera to do this. And they also sell an AC adapter, Canon cells, that you could use. But I just bought a high quality one and, and it works really well. And notice when you unplug this, now the battery you could see is white instead of gray. And you can see that it looks like it's fully charged there. On the side, you also have a microphone port. So you have a mic and a headphone. All right, guys, so looking at the top of the camera, we have a photo video switch here, which is very nice. You can just toggle that depending on what you're doing. Now you have the mode dial here. And depending on what mode you're in, you will have different options in the menu. So for example, when you're in video mode uh, and manual or something like that, you will have different options than if you're in full auto mode and video mode, just as an example. Keep that in mind. We have this little indicator right here that shows you where the sensor is. So if you need to measure for macro photography, that is the sensor plane. We have a record button right here. We have a two stage shutter button. So this is the shutter button right here. If you press it lightly, that will tell the camera to focus. If you press it hard, it'll actually take the photo when in photo mode. If you wanna record video, you can just hit the record video button right here. It will start recording in both photo and video, just so you know, but you really, you probably want to have it in video mode when recording video just so the camera screen represents more what you're doing the screen actually changes up when in video mode compared to photography mode and then you have the on and off switch here which also features a lock option which is very nice so if you have it in lock the dials and stuff will stop working so you won't accidentally be able to change stuff so that feature is handy in some cases if you accidentally change things or if you're handing the camera to somebody that doesn't know what they're doing and you don't want them changing anything now we also have a control dial up here on top which is very nice it actually works separately and in combination with this multi-function button so you can get in there to change some more advanced settings really quick with these two features and you can also control shutter speed and aperture with this dial if you want depending on how the camera is configured now you have another dial here that will control aperture shutter speed depending on how you have the camera configured now looking at the front here, just to show you, we have an AF illuminator light right here. That's what that is. Now these are your stereo mics right here. You also have a lens release button right here. And looking at the back, now here we have a little speaker so you can hear your audio. We have the electronic viewfinder and it has a little sensor here. So when you put your eye up to it, it'll automatically switch to the viewfinder. You have an adjustment on the viewfinder for your vision here if you wear glasses and stuff like me. And then of course you have the menu button here that'll get you into the menu. Now you have a couple other buttons over here. You have an AF on button, an info button, and you have a control pad here, which is four directions. Quite nice with the center button that'll get you into the Q menu. And it'll also act as a enter button or a set button when you're you know, doing certain things in the menu. Now you have a playback here to get into the playback menu to review your photos and videos. And then you have a garbage can here which will delete photos when in playback mode. Now check out this awesome LCD screen. It actually swivels out and now you can use it in selfie mode like this, for example. And then of course the screen swivels like this so if you have the camera low to the ground you can see it easily and then it swivels the other way as well so if you put the camera over your head you can see it very easily and then of course you can close the screen in armor mode like this now i highly recommend closing it in armor mode when you put the camera into your camera bag and stuff like that you know just in case something comes loose in your camera bag and it ends up sitting on the screen while you're hiking that'll just scratch your screen real bad so if you close it like this you can avoid that potential issue and you know if that ever happens also god forbid you drop the camera or something better off having it this way than the other way it'll you'll have a better chance of not breaking the screen now lastly on the top here you have a smart hot shoe and it's, it's pretty tight this cap so you got to like push down pretty hard to get it off but you can mount various accessories such as flash units audio microphones stuff lights you can mount there and so forth 
All right, so looking at the front, we have a body cap. So when we unscrew this, you could take the body cap off and you can see there's like a dash here on the body cap. That dash lines up to the dash on the RF lens mount here, right there. See that lens pin? That is the lock pin that holds the lens on. So to release the lens, you push this in and you can see how the pin goes in. That's how that works. Now down here, this is the electronic contacts for the lens, that's how it communicates. And then of course you have your awesome full frame sensor there. Now you always wanna have the sensor covered by either a body cap or a lens. You never wanna leave it open, like walking around. You don't wanna leave it on your desk, like just sitting there, that'll get dust on the sensor. Definitely don't wanna damage that. Now. Notice how there's a red dash on top of the lens. The RF lenses and RFS lenses all have that red dash. And that's how you know where to line it up to the flange. So you can see how the red lines are lining up. And now you just twist clockwise and you'll hear the click. That's that lens pin release. So now I cannot take the lens off because that pin just locked. So if I push this release, now the lens will untwist because the pin released. That's how that works. Now, looking at the front of the lens, if you take the lens cap off, this is the front lens element, and you have a filter here, a filter thread, which is 58 millimeter. So if you wanna buy polarizers, ND filters, variable ND filters for video and stuff like that, which is what I use, you're gonna need a 58 millimeter for this particular lens. Now, also on the lens here, we have a couple of buttons. We have a stabilization on and off, and we have a manual focus and autofocus switch here. So I'd recommend leaving the stabilizer on unless you're using a tripod. And of course, depending on what you're doing, here's your AF, MF. Now the lens by default is in a closed position. As you can see here, it's in like the closed dot position. So you have to actually twist it to get it to like 24 millimeter. Now the lens is open. So this is where the lens starts. So this is 24 millimeter and then you can zoom by turning it. Now it's at 50 millimeter. So that is the zoom range right there. Now this dial is the manual focus ring and it feels really good actually. It's got some nice feedback to it. Now in addition to using RF lenses, you can also use this adapter. This is the Canon EF to EOS R adapter. Now what's so cool about this is you can use your old EF lenses. For example, I have this awesome old EF 135 millimeter F2 L lens. Now this is one of my favorite lenses for portrait work. I absolutely love this lens and I can use this lens on the Canon R8 with this adapter. So let me show you how that works. Basically you could just unscrew this and now you have this thing, unscrew that. You got the red dot on the adapter and you have the red dot on the lens. So you can just attach that, twist it, nice. Now check this out. Now I have the red dash, you see that? So guess where the red dash goes? Come on, you guys know. So if I take this off, now I can mount up this awesome 135 millimeter F2 L lens like so. So look at this beast. Now I'm using the old Canon EF lens on the R8 and the lens will work just as good as it did on EF cameras. So you will not get some of the more advanced RF lens features, but depending on what you know, have the age of the lens and so forth, you will get excellent performance even on the R8 with this lens. This adapter basically makes it act exactly the same as it did on the EF cameras. Now I was using the Canon 5D Mark II for my professional work and that's what I used this lens for uh, in the past. But what's so cool about this is you could pick up these older EF lenses on eBay, for example, for such a, a fraction of the cost of the original and it's such a high quality optic that I really wanted to just take a minute to show you how you can do this. Now this adapter goes for about $100. So $100 and you can use any EF lens that Canon ever made, which is really awesome. So keep that in mind. It's just food for thought as far as lens options go because there's not that many RF lenses right now, especially high quality affordable ones. They're really expensive. They're really good lenses, don't get me wrong. The high quality RF L lenses are phenomenal options, but they're very expensive. So I just wanted to go over this really quick to show you that you do have uh, an option if you want. You can just get some EF lenses and save yourself tons of money. All right, guys, so I'm just gonna put the camera in full auto mode for now. It's in photography mode, full auto, and I'm just gonna turn it on, like so. All right, I just wanted to give a quick thanks to the sponsor of this video, and that is you. You are the sponsor of this video. You guys are the ones that are watching my videos, and I really appreciate it, and you can really help 
give back by going into the description area and using those affiliate links. It makes a huge difference um, when you use those links. I really appreciate it. I just wanted to thank you very much for your support and again for sponsoring my video. Let's go. This is what you're presented with when you first turn it on. Now, because I'm in full auto mode, it's giving me these options for creative assist. And this is basically how you get more power in full auto mode. And I'm just gonna hit info here, that little checkbox, so this doesn't come up every time I turn the camera on. And I'm gonna click okay. So now the camera's telling me that it's in JPEG mode and it's letting me know that if I switch it to raw quality, I can still apply effects after shooting. So you can do some post-processing work on the camera in playback mode if you shoot raw. So you can basically take a raw image and convert it to JPEG on the camera, which is really cool. Things like that, quite powerful. That's what it's telling me there. I'm just gonna hit check that box again and click okay. And there we have it. So when you first turn this on for the first time, you will be presented to enter the date and time. So I just wanna go into the menu and show you where that is. It's right here. So you go to the wrench icon, page one, and that is the date and time. Now you can go in here and you can just touch where you wanna change, for example, and then you can go up and down with the directional pad and then just click okay when you're done to set the date and time. That's how you do that. Now one other feature I wanna change is the power saving option. And what I don't like is how the screen automatically is dimming after like 10 seconds. So I'm just gonna change that to disable. Auto power off, I'm gonna to set to one minute and that'll give me more time to do what I'm doing, talking during this tutorial without the screen dimming on me. So just so you know, that's where that option is. Now again, in, when you're doing full auto, assuming you guys are total beginners here, remember, beginner's guide, we're gonna go in and I just wanna show you how you can change some of the options here in this setting. So you have presets, again, this menu, it's telling you choose effects from the preset menus and then shoot. So I'm just gonna select that checkbox, click okay. And now presets here, this is where you have all the different presets. You can just scroll through and select them. Notice you got black and white, all sorts of cool stuff, warm, soft, vivid, and so forth. And then down here, you have other features like background blur. So if you wanna manipulate the background blur, you can just tap here and it'll bring it more towards sharp. So that's what that does. Now you can also, I'll just put that back. Now you can also change the brightness. You can change the contrast here, saturation, and then of course you have a couple of other color modes, monochrome, and then within that you have sepia, blue, and so forth. So you have quite a few options here with the Creative Assist, and uh, I'm just gonna shut that off, put it back there. Click OK. Like I said, the Creative Assist just gives you more power when you're in auto mode. So that's what that feature is for, and I recommend checking it out if you wanna you know, try to swing the photos one way or another while in full auto mode. It's a lot of fun, especially playing with the colors and stuff. So now you have a couple other buttons over here. I just wanna show you this top one. If you click that, this is called your shooting mode, or drive mode is what I like to call it. That's what it's called on the Sony cameras. And if you go in here, you can set the drive mode to high speed continuous, low speed continuous, self timer. You have a couple different self timer options. Then you have self timer continuous. Now this is a really cool option because you can set the number to like four shots, for example, something like that. And then what'll happen is if you're setting up like a family portrait, you can hit the self timer button, run into the shot, and it'll take four shots for you. You know how somebody's eyes are always closed? So it'll rattle off four shots, bang, 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 bang. Most likely, all the eyes will be open in one of them, and that's what self timer continuous is for. You know, you could use it for other things also, but that's what I like to use it for. So that's what that feature is. I'm just gonna put it back to single shooting. Now single shooting, when you take a photo, it'll just take one shot. So let me just show you really quick here. So that's single shooting. And notice how after I take the shot, the auto review is coming up for two seconds. So it's actually showing me that the, the photo that I took. You can turn that off in the menu and I'll show you how to do that. But let me just show you when I change it to high speed continuous. See that? So it's shooting high speed continuous and that's how that works. Another option here is the format for the photo files. So right now it is set to large JPEG. If you wanna set it to raw, you can click raw right there. And then enabling raw, you got this option, and then you have compressed raw. So you can take way more photos in compressed raw. As you can see, it says 3000 
96 or 3696 versus 2000. So you have compressed versus uncompressed. And now you could see I'm shooting raw plus JPEG. And you can see right here how that little icon changed. Now it says raw plus JPEG. So I'm just gonna turn raw off for now, hit back, and now I have it set to just JPEG mode again. Click back, and that's how that works. Now, this option here is touch shutter. And again, I'll show you this in the lab, but basically what that does, when you enable it, you can just touch the screen and it'll focus and take the photo, which is pretty cool. And then you can just disable it by pressing that again. Now, if you hit the info button here, it'll change the way the screen looks. So you can hit it again, and now you can see we have the histogram and the auto leveler. Now this is nothing, and now we're back to the default screen. You also have a, a zoom option there, it'll zoom in for you. Now if you hit this Q button here, that'll bring you into the Q menu. When in full auto, it's just bringing up these options that we already looked at. So it's basically just bringing up the creative control uh, when in full auto. Now, let me just switch it into program auto mode. That's gonna be the P option on the top, and it'll give you this preview here for program auto. When you turn the mode dial, it, it, you could see how it gives you like this preview. You can actually turn this off in the menu as well, but I kind of like that, especially for this demonstration. It makes sense to have it on. Now, if you just press the shutter button, it'll bring you into the screen. So now you can see, because I'm in P mode on the top left, there's a P, and I have a bunch of other options here now. There's exposure compensation. If I hit info, it's gonna come up with a lot more information, as you can see. So now I can see all sorts of settings going on. And if you hit the Q button again, you, you can hit the button here, or you can hit the button here. And now we have all these options in the Q menu. And if you just scroll through the different options, on the bottom will be the sub options. So again, if I hit AF, this is the autofocus area. You have all these different options. Now, if I go to AF operation, you have these three options. Now you got subject detect. Again, all these different options. I'm just gonna put that on auto. And again, you got JPEG, you have, so you have the different image quality, drive mode, you have metering mode here. Now up here, we'll bring you back. This is anti-flicker shooting. You have white balance for your color. Now this is picture style. This is just a way to influence how your JPEGs and RAW photos are processed. And now you have creative filters. This will give you all sorts of different looks and it's fun to play with. And then you have your crop ratio. So you can change the way your crop ratio looks. Right now it is set to full frame, but you can set it to crop factor mode if you want, which is a 1.6 crop. Or you got one to one if you wanna set it up as a square and 16 by nine and so forth. So now if I go into the menu here, this is what the menu looks like. Now, if you hit the info button, it will scroll through the top row. So the top row, you have the camera, and uh, this is all the different settings in there. And if you hit info again, you have autofocus AF operation, and notice how you have all these sub tabs. You can see how the top dial will go through the sub options, like that, and then this dial will go through the actual menu items. So it's pretty cool how that works together. You just hit info to go to AF, and then I can go to the different pages, and then I can go down with this dial here, like so. So that's how the menu works, like basic operation of the menu. And notice in P mode here how that's showing you dials. So you can actually turn the dial to change settings. So if I turn the dial here, you could see how the time is changing on this right here. And if I turn this back dial, you can see how the exposure comp is changing right here. So these little orange dials represent the dials on the top of the camera and the back of the camera. And you could also just tap to get into these options as well. So I just tapped on ISO, and now I can change the ISO sensitivity. I can lock it down, or I can just leave it in auto. So program auto is pretty much like a much more powerful version of full auto. So full auto will just do all the thinking for you. Program auto will also do all the thinking for you, but it allows you to change a bunch of stuff as well. So I just wanna show you that quickly here before we go into the lab so you can get an idea of how this stuff works. All right, so I just wanna switch the camera to video mode here, and then I'm gonna put it into program auto mode. And now I wanna show you what the menu looks like in video mode. 
So looking at the screen here, you can see how it completely changed because of recording video. So now you got an audio meter, you got all sorts of options. You have subject detect, this is a monitoring icon. You have a record button there. On the top left, that'll tell you what mode you're in. So if I turn the mode dial to shutter priority, for example, you can see how the picture of the video camera changed. So now it's in AV, now it's in manual. So I'm just gonna put it in program auto right now. And notice how program auto will just give you the option to change the exposure comp by turning this back dial. So you can raise and lower the exposure comp. Pretty simple. But what I wanted to show you was in the menu here, just some of the options for video. So right here you have movie recording size. If you go in there, this is where you can change your recording format. Now what I like to use is right here, 4K 24P standard IPB. Now you can also use IPB light like this option here and you'll get way more recording time. As you could see on the top, it says three hours, 58 minutes. But if you use this option, you're only getting one hour and 59 minutes, just as an example. So these are your different options for recording video. And like I said, that's how I like to have it set. I usually use 24P for my purposes. I'm gonna click OK. Now I just wanna show you high frame rate mode really quick in case you need that feature. To turn that on, you have to go in here to high frame rate and you have to enable it. Now once it's enabled, you click OK. Now I will have different options in the movie record size. So now you can see I have high frame rate options there. And that's where you would go to set that. So I would particularly use the 120p. That's the best quality option right there. That's what I would recommend using, but there is the 180 option. You have the light. IPB light as well. So now high frame rate, when you turn it off, if you wanna go back to normal frame rates, you disable this and then click okay. And notice how it went back to 60p, which is where it was at default. So you do have to set it back to the frame rate that you want, just so you're aware. It does by default put it back to 60p. Not really sure why it does that, but all the Canon cameras appear to act that way. All right, let's go into the lab and I'll show you how this beast works. All right guys, so I am in the lab here and I have the camera set to full auto mode as you can see here, scene intelligent auto. And if you hit the down arrow, it'll give you a little bit more information just so you're aware and each mode will do that. It'll give you like a description. And I'm just gonna click the set button here in the center. That's like the okay button, all right? Just to take a photo here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna point and shoot and now the camera is gonna decide on what to focus on. If I hit the info button here, I can get rid of some of this stuff so it looks a little cleaner. As you can see here, much cleaner. There's some more info, a little bit more info, histogram and leveler. And you can see now I have the leveler uh, set correctly. You can see those green lines. It's a little bit hard to see with the lab scene. If I cover it though, you can see those green lines now. So that's the auto leveler. So that's how you know you have the camera level. Now I'm just gonna hit info again to clean up the image a little. All right, right there is how I like it. So the camera is picking on what to focus when I press the shutter. So I, you have no control over this, basically. You just press the shutter and it chooses. However, you can override this just by touching the screen. So now the camera is going to focus on where I just touched. So it's picking this buffalo up there. I actually touched the dollar bill, though. So now it's on the dollar bill, as you could see there. And notice on the top of the screen, there's a little icon that just popped up. And if you press that, that will deactivate the touch focus. So now the camera will just go back to focusing on what it wants without your touch influence. So let's say I wanted to focus on the background. I just touched back there. Now it's focusing on the background. As you can see, when I turn that off and press the shutter again, it automatically switched to focusing on the scene now. So again, this is just how the camera works by default and you can override it with touch focus. Now check out this touch shutter button here, that little button on the bottom left. So now if you just touch around the screen, it'll focus and take the shot just by touching like so. Now the auto review comes up uh, after you take a photo. So this is the auto review. So if you touch right now, nothing will happen. It'll just zoom in on the image. It might confuse you. That's the auto review. I can turn that off in the menu, but again, that's how that works. So that's how you take a photo, pretty straightforward. So now let me switch it to video mode here and show you how that works really quick. So now again, full auto, I'm just gonna hit record. You could either do it by hitting the button on the top of the camera or you can press the record button right here. So there you have it. Now we're recording video. And I have the set camera set to 4K, 24P, as you saw earlier. Now, if I want to switch to the background, all I got to do is press 
somewhere on the screen for touch focus and it'll automatically smoothly transition to the background or the foreground as you could see there focus on the quarter pretty incredible right now of course you could zoom in and out while recording video so that's 24 millimeter 28 millimeter 35 millimeter and all the way to 50 millimeter so that's what we're looking at for recording video now you can change a couple of things you can again disable the touch by hitting this button on the top next to the Q button but if you go into the Q menu here you have a bunch of different options to choose from now because we're in full auto we are very very limited as to what we can do but you can change the option here you have 4k you have an option here for movie digital stabilization so you can turn that on notice how it crops in a little bit and then you can turn on the super powerful stabilization and it crops in even more so if you're trying to hand hold the camera while walking or whatever you're doing if you need the maximum stabilization it's this option here but you do get a crop as you could see see how it crops in and then when you turn it off that's with stabilization turned off as far as active goes now the lens stabilization is still on so that's the basic operations of using full auto mode all right, so I'm just gonna put it back into photography mode, and then we are gonna go into hybrid auto. So hybrid auto will basically take a little video clip before you take a photo, so it'll like pre-record, and then it'll combine that into like a movie file at the end. So it'll put your photos and videos into like one file and create like a montage, which is pretty cool. It's like a nice feature to have, um, something that I probably won't ever use, but that's what that feature does. Now, the next mode here is scene mode. Now, scene mode is definitely something I'm, I recommend you guys check out. And if you hit the arrow, it'll tell you like what the scene mode does. And it gives you more power by choosing the scene that you're currently in. Now, when in full auto mode, it will automatically identify the scene based on what the camera is seeing, but it doesn't always get it right. So this is where you can go to hard set the camera to make sure it's correct. So for example, if you're a beginner and you're taking pictures of random things, like for example, portraits, you could just set it to portrait mode in scene mode and the camera will be optimized for portraits. And that's what's so powerful about scene mode. Now group photo, you want everybody's face to be sharp and they're at varying distances. Just go into group photo mode and the camera will do all the thinking for you and get you a really nice shot. Landscape, set it to landscape mode. It'll give you punchier colors, sharper images, things like that panorama shot and when you enable panorama mode what you can do is you can just like turn the camera like so hold the button down and it's actually telling you what's going on here you might hear it recording when you're panning just click OK so basically you hold the shutter button down and you take a panorama shot like so and then it'll stitch it all together and you can get a panorama like that that's what panorama mode does and it's so easy to use Highly recommend checking that out. Now that we're in scene mode, if you just go up here to the top left and click it, that'll bring up the options again. So here's another option for sports. So if you guys are going out there and you're shooting sports, this is where you're gonna wanna go. Just set it to sports. Same thing with kids. You got your kids running around in the yard, set it up to the kids photo, boom. Panning, now panning will actually slow the shutter speed down and when you follow an object, like a car for example, it'll create that blurry background, like that motion blur effect. That's what panning is for. Now close-up photography, it'll optimize the camera for that, macro shots, things like that. Now you are limited with what lens you use as to how close you can get to your subject. Every lens has a minimum focus distance, just so you're aware. So you can only get so close to something when focusing. Macro lenses allow you to get really close, and that's why they're specialty lenses made for macro photography. Now if you scroll down further, you got food, so it'll op optimize the camera to try to make the food look as good as possible. You got night portrait. Now for night subjects, the flash is required. Now this camera does not have a built-in flash, so you would have to have one attached to the camera to use this mode. Now handheld night scene, what this does, it, ideally you do want to be on a tripod for shots like this, but you don't have to. That's what's cool about this mode. It'll automatically take multiple shots and then combine them to create a sharper, cleaner image. So it'll cancel out the noise, it'll cancel out a little bit of that motion blur that you might have, 
and it'll give you the best shot possible if you're hand holding at nighttime. Now you have here HDR backlit control. This is great if your subject is being backlit by something and it's extremely bright because normally what the camera will do is it'll underexpose the face and it'll look like garbage. So what you need to do is enable this mode and it'll take multiple shots and then you'll get a good exposure for the face and the background. And then you have silent shutter mode. Now this is great if you're at like a wedding or baby shower or you're in church or something like that and you want to take photos but you don't want the camera making any noise. Notice the beeping when uh, you, you don't have it in silent mode. Hear that? So now when we put it into silent mode, see how it's not making any noise? And it switched the camera to an electronic shutter as well so you don't hear the shutter, which is uh, great if you want to be quiet. So for example, now listen, you hear that? That's the shutter sound. So that's what scene mode is all about. And I highly recommend checking it out because it's super powerful if you're a beginner to the camera. You could basically just decide what scene you're in and the camera will be optimized for that scene. Now we have creative filters. And if you scroll down here, it'll give you a little more information. Special effects, basically. So let's go to choose filter. Now you have grainy black and white, you have soft focus, all sorts of stuff. You have fisheye effect, water painting effect, toy camera effect, miniature effect, HDR art, and then you have HDR vivid, HDR bold art, and then you have HDR embossed. So a bunch of different features there for grainy black and white, and that is what that mode is for. So the next mode I want to talk about is flexible priority auto exposure. This mode is incredible because you could basically set the camera to whatever mode you want. And it's, it's really powerful. Let me show you. All right, guys, so in flexible auto mode, you have the little orange dial here. So that little orange dial is telling you that you can change settings with the top dial. Now, if you want to change what settings you, you want, you just have to move the rear dial. So this other dial here will switch. So now it's on aperture. So this is shutter. TV stands for shutter mode. So right now, basically, the camera's in shutter priority mode when you have it set like this. So now I can just change the shutter speed. As you can see, everything else is in auto. So I'm going to put that back to auto. Now I'm going to move the dial. Now it's on aperture priority mode. So if I change this, I can change the aperture and everything else is in auto. So this is a really cool mode for power, really. Now if I change this dial again, now it's set to exposure compensation. So if I turn the dial, that's gonna manipulate the exposure comp. If I turn it one more time, now I have the camera set to ISO. So now I can change and set the ISO manually as I see fit. So that is what's cool about flexible exposure mode. You can literally set the camera to whatever mode you want. You can have these things set to auto or you can change them to something. Uh, it's, it's really up to you how you use it, but it's a very good mode if you're not sure which mode you want to use. I'm just going to put that back to auto. All right, so there we have it. So that is flexible exposure mode. And again, you have the Q menu here. You can go in here and change some options if you like. So the next mode we're going to go into is going to be program auto. Now I already showed you program auto. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit more information here now that we're in the lab. So program auto, you could touch on here and change some stuff. I have the ISO set to auto right now, but you can hard set it if you want. And also note, you can change the shutter speed by default in program auto. If you turn this dial, it will allow you to change the shutter speed and notice how it's changing the aperture automatically. So it's trying to maintain exposure as best it can while changing the aperture and trying to keep the ISO at a reasonable number. That's program auto. And this rear dial, of course, is going to change the exposure compensation. All right, so I just wanted to show you this multifunction button here on the top of the camera. It's the MFN button. When you hit that button, it brings up this quick menu here, and this will give you quick access to these features that it's currently set to. And notice how it's giving you a dial on the top and a dial on the bottom. Those represent the dials. So the top one, you could see if I turn it, it's changing the white balance. Now the back one is gonna change the metering. Now if we just keep hitting the button, it'll go through the different options. So these are your autofocus options and drive mode options on the top. Now here is your ISO and exposure comp you can change. And here is your autofocus 
And then you have your different styles on the top that you can change as well. So this is a great like shortcut. Now you can get to a lot of this stuff in the Q menu as well. A lot of these are duplicated. It's just a different way of operating the camera. So let me just show you metering mode really quick. What metering mode does is it decides how the camera exposes. So for example, if I go back here and I change it to spot metering, for example. Now you could see that little circle on the screen. The camera is only gonna look there when it's trying to figure out the exposure. So let me take the lens cap back off. So you can see how the exposure looks pretty much the same, but watch when I have a light here, if when I add a light to the scene. Now you see how it's exposing for the light only, and if I move the light out of the circle, it's not exposing for the light. Isn't that interesting? So that's what spot metering's for. So if you think about it, if you have like something that's super bright in your scene and you want to expose for it, like picture like a light bulb or white frothy water in rapids or you know anything like that, a wedding dress for example, you can use metering modes to help you get the proper exposure. And notice if I put it into partial metering here, partial metering uses the center area as well, it's just larger. So you could see here it's a little bigger and it works very similar to spot metering, it's just a bigger circle. And you can change that by going up here as well. That's spot metering, average, and that's what it is at default, so that's multi-metering mode. So now if I put the light into the scene, you see how it's not really affecting it? It does affect it a little bit when I put it towards the center because it does prioritize that by default but you can see how it doesn't have near an effect. And that's what metering mode does. So it's a powerful tool. Now I also still have touch shutter enabled. So I wanna disable that by pressing this button right here. That will disable, touch shutter disabled. And touch focus, I'm gonna turn that off right there. Okay, so again, program auto mode. All right, so I just wanna go into the Q menu here and I wanted to just show you the different autofocus areas right here. So these are the different autofocus areas. Now, why you might want to change this, basically what this does is it limits the camera as to where it can focus. Like if you look now, you can see there's just that little box in the center. So the camera can only focus on that little box. It's not going to use the rest of the sensor. So it basically just limits where the focus can be. Now you can also override it by touching and notice how it's still that little box. So it's only going to focus on that tiny little spot. But again, you could limit the autofocus with autofocus area mode. So for autofocus, this option here, whole area AF is what you're going to want for the whole sensor. So that's what I have selected now. And now you can see the focus points are all over the place. It's just going to pick anywhere on the sensor that it thinks it needs to focus. All right, so you remember the image review, how when you take a photo it keeps popping up? This is where you can go to turn that off. So I'm just gonna go in here and turn that off because I do not like image review. It drives me crazy, but you guys might want that on and it is on by default. All right, so in the menu here, you have a couple of options here. Dual pixel raw, this is where you can go to enable that. Now you have cropping aspect ratio, you have digital teleconverter. So that'll just zoom in for you with some digital. Now in here you have ISO speed settings. If you go into here, this is where you can select your ISO range. So right now the range is set to 100 all the way up to 102,000. Now you can go in here and you could limit that. If you click it, you could make it go even higher to 200,000 or you can limit it to like 25,600. So let's set it there. Now the camera won't go higher than that. Let's click OK. And again, you can just touch the screen or use the directional pad. Now you also have auto ISO range. Now this you can change if you want as well. It's up to you. Now, minimum shutter speed. This is a great feature. If you guys are out there and you do not want the camera to take a slow shutter, this is where you can go and set it to faster. Uh, this is also great for somebody that has shaky hands. If you see by default, the camera is choosing 1 60th of a second. It's kind of hard to see. On the bottom left, you see how it says 1 60th? It's fluctuating between 1 60th and 1 80th. If you go into the menu here, this is where you can change that. So let's set it to manual and here you can go and you can actually pick your shutter speed or you can just turn this dial, set it to auto one or auto two for example, like that. And I'm just gonna set okay. And now if you look at the shutter speed, see how it's at one two fiftieth of a second? 
one two hundredth. So with the scene lit properly, it's at one two fiftieth of a second now. So this is how you would get a faster shutter if you're hand holding automatically in program auto mode. So you don't have to know, you don't have to use shutter priority mode, for example, to get a faster shutter. Again, this is great for somebody with shaky hands that's getting blurry shots, hand holding, and you just want a little bit of a faster shutter speed. That's where you would go to do that. I'm just going to put that back to default. And like I said, if you go into manual mode, you can actually pick. So you can set it to like 1 500th of a second if you're taking sports photos, for example, and you want to use program auto mode. Now you have HDR shooting here. This is HDR PQ. This is for advanced high dynamic range. HDR mode, if we turn this on, you can you have two different options. You got moving subject and you got dynamic range. So normally I would use dynamic range for the most part. And what it'll do is it'll take multiple photos. Now you can set it up for one shot or you can set it up for every shot. So what one shot means is it'll just take the one set of HDRs and that'll that'll do it. Now it's set to auto by default, but you can change the EV amount as well, depending on how much dynamic range is in the scene. And then when we go to take the photo, see how it took multiple shots? Now it's combining the shots and it's going to give us an auto HDR. That's what the auto HDR looks like. You can see that dynamic range is much higher than a standard JPEG image that looks more like that. See the difference? That versus that. So that's auto HDR, and that's how you would go about doing it on this camera. And notice how it went back to off because I only had it set to single shot. So right here, if I have it set to every shot, it'll stay in auto HDR mode, and you can just keep taking auto HDRs over and over and over. So that's what that means. All right, so if I hit the Q menu here, I just want to show you how white balance works. So right now I have it set to auto white balance, but you can change that. And what white balance is, is it's basically trying to figure out what white is. So white can be either like cooler or warmer. You know, you've all seen warm images. You can see when I have it set to shade, how much warmer it got. And now this is set to indoor incandescent lighting. So you can see how everything went blue. And again, this is how the camera figures out what white is supposed to be. If I go back to auto white balance, it'll do a pretty good job. And up here, you actually have options here. Auto ambience priority. So you can set it to white priority or ambience. It's up to you. And auto white balance works pretty darn good, but I would recommend hard setting it if you're doing something with people's faces in it because you don't want the auto white balance shifting around if you're at a party or something. Otherwise, skin tones will fluctuate depending on what the camera sees. So I would recommend hard setting it when you need to. And then we have auto lighting optimizer. This will just help enhance shadows, protect the highlights. You can control the amount and what you want to do here with this option. I just have it set for standard again. Standard seems to work pretty good for most of this stuff. Menu, highlight tone priority. You can enable that if you want and it'll help protect your highlights. Again, I have it disabled. These are all exposure options. Now, if we keep going over, we have a couple different features. Anti-flicker. If you have flickering lights that are driving you crazy, you can go in here and turn this on, and that will help with that. And, of course, we have metering mode. Speed light control stands for an on-camera flash. And we already went over metering modes. White balance. Here we go. Custom white balance. Color space. You could set this to a different color space if you want. I just leave it on sRGB. Picture style, here's all your different picture styles. I like to use standard for the most part, but you can go in here and this will pretty much dictate on how your files are processed by the camera. If you keep going down here, these ones you can set to however you want. So if you go in, you can actually manipulate what they're set to. If you go to info detail, you can actually go in there and change all this stuff and create a custom option if you want. So I'm just gonna leave that to standard for now. Then you have clarity. It'll just add more contrast, basically, so you can jack it up or lower it. It's kind of what clarity does. It's like contrast and sharpness, sort of. Shooting creative filters, we already went over that. There's a mode for that, the creative filters. Now here, we have some lens correction stuff. And uh, if you go in here, I have it turned on. And it'll just do basic corrections for the lens. It recognizes the lens there, as you can see. And distortion correction is not available. 
pretty much how I have it set. It's all set to default. But you can go in here and change that. You can make it set to high, or you can turn it off if you want. Hit menu, go back. Now we have long exposure noise reduction. If you guys are doing really long exposures, you can turn that on and it'll help clean up the noise. Um, high ISO noise reduction, that will also help clean up the noise if uh, you're taking, you know, really, if you're using really high ISO values. Now dust delete data, if you get dust on the sensor, you can uh, go in here and it'll analyze it and try to cancel it out for you. Now page six, multiple exposures. It'll basically combine photos for you and you can choose which way it combines photos. So it'll, it's like different modes for combination. And it'll actually blend the images together and almost create, it's, it's interesting how it works. It actually will combine them. Let's do additive, let's enable it. You see how that is ghosting on the top of the screen there? So now if I take another shot, it's going to combine them. If I go into playback mode, you could see here how it's com it combined both shots. It's like additive was the, the mode that I used. So that's what multi-shot does. And there's, like I said, there's a couple of different modes. You got brightness and so forth. Number of exposures, so you can do like five shots. And uh, it's an interesting feature. I recommend checking it out. Now you have raw burst mode, really cool feature. Focus bracketing, this is great for macro photography. It'll take multiple photos at different focus points and it'll just help you get a sharper shot if you're doing macro photography or if you wanna do focus stacking. We already talked about drive mode. Interval timer, now if you enable that, this will allow you to do time lapse. So you can enable interval timer and then you can go in there and configure it if you go to info detail, this is how you can configure it. So number of shots that you're taking, you know, you could set it to like 400 or whatever, and it'll take a long series of photos and then you could make a movie out of them after the fact if you want. And that's what interval timer is for. Now you have silent shutter function. I already talked about that in scene mode. So you can enable that here if you're in a different mode. Now shutter mode, you have electronic first curtain, electronic, if you need a faster, option you could use electronic but I recommend using electronic first curtain for the better quality especially when you're shooting sports and stuff like that now release without card this will just allow the camera to take photos when there's no memory card in there if you want that enabled now image stabilization mode I have this turned off but if you are hand holding and you want really good stabilization I recommend turning this on Customize quick controls. Now remember, I told you how you can customize what's going on with the quick controls. This is where you can go and do that. And notice how these are the default options and you can change that, which is really powerful. So by quick controls, that's what this Q menu is. This is the customize, this is the quick controls. So this is what you can go and change if you want to in this option here. Touch shutter, we already went over that. Image review, we went over that. Metering timer, I just have that set for default. Now display simulation, I like to have that set to exposure and depth of field. Shooting info display, this is where you can go to change what your screens look like when you hit the info button. So you can go in there and change that. You could also enable the grid. I like the three by three grid. So now you can see there's the grid on the screen. If I cover it, you can see it a little better, the grid. I like using the grid to help make sure the horizons are level, but you can also just hit the info button and use the auto leveler. Viewfinder, that stands for this up here, display format, so you can go in there and you can change what this looks like. Now, when you put your eye up to this, it is kind of hard to see the edges, unless you really have your eye right up on that screen. And notice how you can see it turn on when I cover the uh, little sensor. So it's just a little TV in there, basically. But if you go to display two, you see how it crops in that little bit? So if you're using glasses and you can't get your eye like right up on the screen, display two is a better way to go because it just makes it a little smaller and it's easier to see the edges. So I like particularly having it on display two because I wear glasses. Now display performance, you can change the way that that performs. I have it set to power saving. Now you can also have it set to smooth, which will cost you a little bit more power, but it will look better in the viewfinder, especially if you're tracking moving subjects and stuff. So that's worth considering changing depending on what you're doing. Now over here, we have movie recording settings and uh, you can change the ISO and the shutter, auto slow shutter. I recommend leaving most of this stuff at default. The ISO you may wanna change in here. So the max is 25,600. 
It will let you raise it up even higher though if you want. So you may want to go in there. That's where that option is if you need to change that stuff. Now shutter button for movies, you can actually make the shutter button record if you want, but there's a dedicated record button, so I wouldn't bother changing that. Now AF settings, if you go in here to autofocus settings, you have a lot of options here. Right now it's set to one shot instead of, you know, continuous shooting. Now we have autofocus area, we already talked about that. You could limit the autofocus. Whole area tracking in servo mode, that is set to on. So it will track subjects using the whole screen. Subject tracking, I have it set to auto, but if you are shooting animals and stuff like that, you might want to hard set it to what you're actually shooting. Eye detection, same thing. I have that set to auto, but you can go in there and you can change that. You can have it disabled if you want, or you can pick the particular eye that you want. Now, this is the sensitivity as to which the subject will switch. So if the camera sees something else in the scene and it thinks it should focus on that, this is how sensitive that is. So you can change this if you want to switch subject or stay on the initial subject. So this will make it lock on harder to the original subject. This will make it switch sooner to another subject. So right now I have it set to just default, which is fine. You got focus mode, autofocus versus manual focus. And the reason why that's grayed out is because there's a switch on the lens. If the lens did not have a switch, you would be able to change that here. Now in here we have a bunch of different servo AF presets and this is extremely powerful and this is where you want to go to just change how the camera works when it's auto focusing. You got tracking sensitivity, acceleration, deceleration, so if there's a subject coming fast towards you for example and it'll give you a description. It says right here accelerating and decelerating quickly, you know what I mean? So you could just read through these and choose the one that makes most sense to you, you know, continue to track subjects, ignoring others. So this is like if you're tracking a moving subject and you don't want it to pick up another subject, you can select this option, versatile multi-purpose setting, and then you, of course you have auto. So if we go to page three, this is the priority here. I'm just gonna set that at default. Now the autofocus assist beam is that light on the front of the camera that will light up when you try to focus when it's really dark. It'll just help assist the camera. Touch and drag AF settings. Now you can enable that if you want um, and it'll help you when you're using the viewfinder if you want to touch the screen to change the autofocus points and stuff like that. Limit area options. You can go in here and you can uncheck some of these. So when you go to the autofocus area, you won't have so many options to choose from. So that's like a customization area. Orientation link. So if you don't know what something is, notice how it has this info help. You can go in here and it'll explain in more detail like what that feature does. So that's pretty powerful. You could limit the subject detection. Same thing with the autofocus area. So you can like turn off automobiles or whatever if you're never gonna track automobiles and then you'll have less options. Left, right eye detection. Peaking settings, now manual focus peaking settings, when you turn that on, it'll help you manual focus. And let's just turn it on, and I'll show you what I mean. If I put the camera into manual focus, you see those peaking color? It's like red, it comes up red. If we zoom in to 50, it'll be a little easier to see. Once I get it near focus, there you go. See how that, it's like highlighting in red? That's focus peaking, so it's pretty much showing you where the contrast is and it'll help you focus if you need to. And you can also zoom in. So you can zoom in like so, and then you can also dial in your focus and you can move around. Like if I wanted to focus on the quarter, for example, you could now dial that in. Right about there looks sharp. Just hit okay, like so. So again, to zoom in, you can just hit this button over here and then hit info and it'll zoom in for you. So that works pretty good. I'll zoom in even more and then zoom back out. And that's pretty much what focus peaking does. And you can change, if you go in here, you can change the color of it. It's set to red by default. You can change that depending on what you're shooting. Focus guide, let's turn that on and I'll show you what that does. Now watch when I turn the autofocus, it's gonna give you like a guide. It's kind of hard to see, but you could see it there under my hand. And when you turn the manual focus, the guide will adjust. So if I go back to the scene, when all the triangles are like lined up in green, like right there. So it's just another tool and it works quite good. Movie Servo AF, that's just telling you that the when in movie mode, the autofocus will be working.
focus ring rotation, you can change that. You can also change the sensitivity of the rotation. Very powerful. Now here is the playback options. This is where you can go to manipulate your photos. You can uh, protect them, you can erase them, you can rotate them, uh, you can rate them and so forth. Now raw image processing, this is where you can go and you can convert raw files to JPEG and things like that. Now you got creative assist, so you can go in there and manipulate the photos if you want. Quick control raw processing. You could resize, crop. You can have a slideshow, so if you want to plug this into a TV and show a slideshow or something. Now AF point display, I like to enable that and that will show you where you were focused in playback. So you could see here the focus points are now showing. So that's where the focus was on that photo. And here on this one you can see there's the red box there in the center. So that's what that feature does. Now it does get a little overwhelming sometimes if you have a lot of focus points. So you might want to disable that, but that's where that is. And then you got the grid, record time, HDMI, HDR output if you're plugging into an HDR TV or device. You can turn that on. Now in here is where you would go to set up the smartphone connections. Now guys, I have a dedicated video about this on the Canon Connect app, and it'll walk you through this process. It's not that hard, but it is a little bit cumbersome. You know, you have to do a couple of things to get through there. And now in here you have airplane mode, Wi-Fi settings, your camera name, which you can change if you want, GPS settings, you could reset the communication settings. So if you have this paired with an, an old phone, and you want to you know reset the communications because you don't have that phone anymore you can go in here and do that now here is the wrench area and this is where there's a lot of other options so you have file folder numbering continuous so that the files will automatically count up you can format the memory card this is where you can go and erase the memory card i highly recommend doing that in camera not on the computer just so you know auto rotate so this will auto rotate if you're shooting vertical horizontal and so forth you can add the rotate information if you want. Right now it's disabled. This is where you would go to set your date and time. Here's where your language is at. Now video system. Right now it is set to NTSC because I am in North America. But if you are a European nation and you use the PAL format, you could change that there. And this will actually change the frame rates that you record at. So PAL, for example, would be 25 frames per second instead of 24. PAL would also be 50 frames instead of 60, and it would be 100 frames instead of 120. So if you're looking for that, you gotta go in here and change the camera to PAL mode. Now, help text. You can make this larger if you want. Like if you're having a hard time seeing stuff, you can make it larger. Pretty cool. Mode guide. This, what that means is when you change the mode, this is the mode guide. So it's giving you a, a, rep, a visual representation of what the mode is. So you can turn that on and off there. I, I like to have it enabled though, it's kind of cool. Featured guide does the same thing, it just depends on what feature you're using. It'll give you, you know, a preview of the feature. Now beeping, you can turn that on and off. I'm going to disable that, not a big fan of the beeping. Headphones, this is where you can go and select your uh, monitoring and the volume for the headphones. Power saving, I already went in here, but this is where you can go and turn the camera, you know, so it shuts off quicker or doesn't shut off at all. Now screen view display, you can go in here and you can change that. So right now it's set to screen only. I like to have it set to auto switching. So I like to have it set to auto switching, but when you have the screen swiveled out, you might not want it set to auto switching. When the screen is closed, it will automatically switch to the viewfinder as you can see here. But when the screen is open like this, you see how it's not auto switching? That's what this means. So a lot of times when you have the screen open, you might put your hand over the viewfinder doing something so you can have it set. But I like it to auto switch. So I'm going to change that to two. And now it will auto switch with the screen open. See that? So I like having it set that way. Now screen brightness, super helpful. If you're outside in bright conditions, you're going to want to jack this up. Or if you're in really dark conditions, you might want to lower it a lot. So that's where you would go to do that. And you got viewfinder brightness works the same way. It's set to auto by default. And you can also fine tune the viewfinder color, which is pretty cool. Now you have user interface magnification. So you can enable that. And now if you double tap the screen, as you can see there, it just blew up the screen size. Now you can move it around and read it better. So it's a double tap on the screen with two fingers. And that'll bring it back. I'm just going to disable that. But this is nice if you're visually impaired, you know, and you need the text bigger. 
Now, HDMI resolution, I just have that set to auto, but you may have to change that if you're having issues plugging into a specific monitor or whatever you're up to. Touch control, this is where you can go to turn off touch control or you can set it to sensitive. So sometimes you might have noticed when I touch the screen, it's not responding. Sensitive would make it more sensitive to that. Or if you just do not want touch, you would go in here to turn that off. Now, multifunction lock. This is where you can go and you can lock dials if you want so they don't do anything. And it just gives you more customizable control. Sensor cleaning, that will uh, try to clean the sensor for you. And then choose USB connection app. This is where you can go and you can use the various options for the USB. So you might have to change this depending on what you're doing, just so you are aware. That's where that option is. Now here's where you would go to reset the camera if you want to, like if you're selling it or something. You can go in here and mess with your custom shooting options here. This is where you can go and register settings. So you would go and set the camera how you want it, and then you would go in here and register the settings. And then when you switch the camera to C1, it'll recall those settings. So you could also clear them if you want. So you can have custom one set to like sports, for example, custom two set to like landscapes. And this is where you would go to set that up. Battery info, this will just tell you what your battery is at. Copyright info, this is where you can go and you can enter your name and it'll automatically embed that into the files for you. Now, if you go in here and you just scan this with your phone, that's the QR code for the manual, and uh, that's just awesome. So you can just scan it, boom, bring the manual up if you need some help. Certification logo display, and then firmware. So this is currently at firmware version 1.0. Now, if we go further to the right, this is where a lot of the customization options are for the camera. So you can change how the exposure increments go. You can go in here and set it to half a stop or a third of a stop. And you got a bunch of different options in here. So this is where you would go to set up bracketing options. And I usually have it set up to three, like so. And safety shift, if you turn that on, that will actually try to help you with auto bracketing. If you go in here and you hit info, it'll actually give you more information. And it'll just help with overexposure and underexposure if you run out of like shutter speed or if your bracketing isn't far enough, like not wide enough, that will help you with that. And you can choose either shutter speed or aperture or ISO to use that feature. Now, this option will keep the exposure the same if you change the aperture, which is an interesting option. They have auto exposure lock meter after you focus. So once you hold the focus down, the brightness and the darkness won't change if you have this locked. So that's how that works. Now you can set your shutter speed range if you want. That's another option there. You can limit it or expand it. And you can do the same thing for aperture. So you could limit it or expand it if you want. Pretty cool, it has that feature. Now here's where you can change the, the way your dials work and what they do, what rotation. You can customize all this stuff if you want. So, and then custom buttons. If you go in here, this is where you can control what different buttons do and uh, it gives you a lot of options. You can see how the buttons highlight as you go down. And that's, it's just representing what button is what, and then when you click on it, you can go in here and change it to various options. So this camera is highly customizable. Customized dials. Now again, this is where you can go and you can make the dial on the top. If you're in manual mode, you can change it if you want, for example. And this is where you would go to clear custom settings. Now here's where you can add cropping information if you want to do that. Audio compression is on by default. You can turn that off or disable it. Now you have garbage can options. Release shutter without lens. Now this is an important feature because if you're using a fully manual lens, you know, from like seven artisans or something, the camera won't recognize it and it won't take a photo. You have to enable this in order to do it. So now the camera will take a photo if it doesn't see a lens on there. And remember, a fully manual lens with no electronics, the camera's gonna think there's no lens on there. So that's why it has that feature. And by default, that's off. Now, retract lens, if you have a power zoom lens that auto retracts, this will allow it to auto retract for you. Now this is where you can go to clear all those custom settings. Now this area is the My Menu tab. And this is a cool spot because this is where you can put all those features that are deep in the menu that you can't get to quickly with the Q menu or the multifunction button up here. So for example, if I wanted to format the memory card, I can add that in here. So I'm going to add a new tab. I'm going to click OK. And now I'm going to configure that tab. 
So select items to register. Yes, that's what I want to do. So now if we scroll through, you can just go in here and find whatever option it is you're looking for. And there's a ton of options. So I'm just looking for format. I want to format the memory card. That's the option that I use most when it comes to my menu. Right there, format card. So I'm going to click that. I'm going to add it. OK. And now if I hit menu to go back, menu again, now you can see format card is in my menu. So if I just hit the info button and scroll through the menus, go to my menu, now I have format card right there. And that's just an easy way to format the card. After you take the photos and videos off, of course, you would put the memory card back in the camera. And once your stuff's backed up, you could then format the card very simply. So the next mode we're going to go into is going to be shutter priority mode. So let me show you what shutter priority mode does. And as you can see, you can freeze the action right here, frozen water, or you can get motion blur right here. You can see blurry water. So that's what shutter priority is known for. So if you're shooting sports or something like that, you can go into scene mode, set it to sports, or you can go into shutter priority mode like this. And now you can see, if you look at the bottom left, all you have to do is turn the dial and that will set the shutter speed. So if I'm doing sports, I can set it to 1 500th of a second and the camera will take care of all the other stuff for me. That's what shutter priority mode does. Now if I want to capture motion, I can lower the shutter down to like 1 4th of a second, for example. And let me just show you what I mean. Let me zoom out. I'm just going to turn the camera a little bit. Like that. Alright, so now check this out. Watch what happens when I take a photo with the, that thing spinning. So if I go into playback, you see the motion blur? So that simulates when it was showing you before the blurry water. That's motion blur, and that's how you capture it with shutter speed. So that was one quarter of a second. So now let me speed up the shutter to like one five hundredth of a second to simulate a sports athlete running. And now if I take the photo and I go to playback, see how it froze the action? So that's how shutter priority works. You can basically freeze action or you can get motion blur. And another cool thing to do when trying to capture motion blur would be to set the self timer so you don't get any camera shake. So for example, if I go in here, if I go into drive mode and I set the self timer to like two seconds, like so, and now I set the shutter speed, let's set it to, it's set to a quarter second. So now when I press the shutter button, it'll have two seconds to stop shaking before it starts recording the photo. Watch. All right, so I'm gonna spin this first. And now I'm gonna hit the button. And now the self timer is going, you can see it flashing, and now it took the photo. So what's cool about self timer is it allows the camera to stop shaking if you're touching it with your hand. Now if you're using the phone to control it, a smart device, or the remote control, you wouldn't have to worry about that because you're not touching the camera. But as you can see, when you touch the camera, it's going to move just that little bit. And with a long exposure, you do not want that because, you know, all the stuff that's sharp will look a little bit bl blurry due to the camera shake. So keep that in mind. All right, let me just put this back here. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to go into aperture priority mode. And aperture priority mode, as you can see here, it's showing a scene with sharpness in the foreground and the background. And as you can see on the left-hand side, it's showing just the book sharp and like the background blurry. And that's what aperture priority mode really helps you with. It changes the size of the aperture diaphragm. Now the aperture diaphragm is literally like the pupil of your eye. So a wide open lens has a wide open aperture. So you might have heard the term wide open. So right here, the aperture is at f4.5, and that is the maximum aperture. So that's as wide as the aperture can go on this particular lens at this particular focal length. Now if I zoom the lens in, you see how the aperture just changed? That's because this is a variable aperture lens. So now I'm at 50 millimeter. As you can see right there, it actually gives you the focal range. Uh, right next to the simulation display. Now you can see it says 24 all the way to 50. So at 50 millimeter, the fastest aperture you can have is f6.3 on this particular lens. Now notice when I turn this dial, the aperture is going to go up in numbers. See how it went from f6.3 all the way up to f22? So now it's actually at f32. And if you look, you could see the background and the foreground both look pretty sharp. So I'm just going to click over on the dollar bill take a photo, and I have the two second self timer set, so it's going to take a nice sharp shot. Now watch when I lower it to f6.3. And now if I go into the playback menu, 
All right, so this is at f6.3, and you can see the lights are like blurry. Now this one, they're not as blurry as you can see. So if I zoom in, you can see the lights are a lot sharper. And if I hit the info button, you could see because I was at f32. And then again, at f6.3, you could see that blurry background. So that's what Aperture does. So it helps with the depth of field. You know, the blurrier the background, the more shallow the depth of field is. The sharper the background, the larger the depth of field is. Also, the larger the aperture, the more light that you're going to allow in to the camera in a less period of time. And how I can show you that is if I change the ISO. So if I just click on the ISO, right now it's set to auto. So if I change the ISO to like 100, let's, let's set it to like right there, 250. So now the ISO is on 250. Now look at the aperture, it's at f6.3. The shutter is at one tenth of a second. So now watch what happens when I change the aperture to like f11 or f10. So now I'm at f11. Now you can see the shutter speed is at one third of a second or whatever, three tenths of a second. So the shutter speed has to slow down because the hole's getting smaller, right? I got a tiny little hole there now. When I have the, the aperture set to f32, it is a really, really tiny hole. So it's gonna take a long time for that light to travel just because it's such a small hole. So it's gonna take 2.5 seconds for the water to flow through. If you picture like a hose and there's water flowing through it, so now I'm pinching the hose. I'm pinching that hose down. It's gonna take longer for the water to trickle through and that is represented as time, as you can see right there. So look, I'll put it right back to the fastest aperture right now is the fastest, one tenth of a second is the best I can do. So in order to get a faster shutter speed, I'm going to have to raise up the ISO. So let me just put it to auto. And now if I press it down, you can see the ISO is at 1600. So 1600 is giving me 1 60th of a second at f6.3. So that's pretty much how that works. Now, watch what happens when we put it into manual mode. So manual mode is going to give us full control of the camera, as you can see here. Now, it doesn't have three separate dials for tri-navi control but you can just touch at what you want to change. So for example, if I put the ISO here at 100, you could see how the screen went black. And that makes sense because right now, um, at ISO 100 and the shutter speed at 1 1 of a second, that's not near enough time for the light to gather up in the sensor for a proper exposure. So watch what happens when we slow the shutter speed down and allow more time for the light to get in to the sensor. Again, because the aperture is at f6.3, so I can't open that up anymore at 50 millimeter. So let's let more time pass. Watch that shutter speed, 1 30th, 1 20th, 1 15th, 1 10th, and so forth. So right about there, let's say, looks like a pretty good exposure. So that's what manual mode allows you to do. It allows you to underexpose, overexpose. You can manipulate all these settings individually if you want. So I can change the aperture to like f11 and now you can see it's dark so I'm gonna to have to make it even longer to get a proper exposure and notice how this exposure meter you could see it going back and forth when you're in manual mode this becomes like an exposure meter and it'll tell you if you're overexposed or underexposed and you can also hit the info button and use the histogram and you can see how the histogram shifts so now it's underexposed that looks like a pretty good exposure. And you can see now it's overexposed because everything is to the right side of the histogram. So right about there is a balanced exposure based on this scene of what the camera is seeing. And that's pretty much how manual mode works. So that's full power. And if you're recording video, let me just switch this to video mode for a second. So if I were recording video right now, because I have the camera set to 24p, I would want the shutter speed to be double that. So ideally, I would want the shutter at 1 50th of a second because I'm recording at 24p. If I was recording at 60p, I would want to double that and I would want to have it at like 1 1 25th of a second. If I was recording in 120 frames per second, I would want to have this at 1 2 50th of a second. So you always want to double the frame rate ideally when recording video. Now you can't always do that because it might be too bright out or whatever. And in those cases, that's when you can put an ND filter, which is basically like sunglasses on the lens. So you can get that slower shutter speed in bright conditions. With this lens, it's not too much of a problem because the aperture is kind of slow. 
But if I was using like a 35 millimeter f1.8 lens, for example, and I wanted to record at 1 50th of a second, I would have to put like sunglasses on the lens, which is called an ND filter. Or I would have to have a much faster shutter speed. And you don't want to do that ideally. You, you can record with a faster shutter speed, no problem, but it will look like a little bit jittery because there's no motion blur captured. And the human eye is used to seeing a little bit of motion when you're watching film. So that's why there's these rules where it, you know, ideally you want to use double the frame rate. So that's one of the rules. So I just wanted to show you that really quick when recording video. So again, that's how I would have it set. And then you could just hit record. And now it's recording at the proper frame rate. All right, guys, so I have the camera in video mode and full manual mode. And this is more for advanced shooters, but this is where you would go to set log settings. So if you want to use C-Log3, this is where you would go to enable it, right here. C-Log3, click OK, and there you have it. And this is where you can turn View Assist on, and that will simulate Rec. 709, which will make the screen not look so flat. So I recommend turning that on. And color space is set to BT709, which is fine. And now you're ready to go for log shooting. So if you want the most dynamic range and you want to do your grading after the fact, like video grading in Final Cut Pro, for example, which is what I do. So I didn't really go over that because this is a more of a beginner's guide. But once you guys get to the point where you're looking for best quality possible, you can go for the log settings. All right, let me put it back into photography mode. And now if I switch it to bulb mode, bulb mode will allow you to basically have the shutter open as long as you want. Now the downside is you do have to hold the button down so you really do want to use a remote or the Canon Connect app for this purpose because the only way to really do it is to hold the shutter down. As you hold the shutter down because I have self timer on you can see how the counter goes up. So this is just going to expose for as long as I hold the shutter down. And again this is going to introduce camera shake which is no good which is why you need a remote control for this or like I said use the Canon Connect app. So I'm just going to let go and you should see it's going to be way overexposed as you can see here because I had it you know it was like a 10 second actually 14 second exposure. So that's what we're looking at when it comes to bulb mode. All right guys, that about wraps up the beginner's guide for the Canon R8. Now, I really hope you got what you were looking for and don't forget below the video, I'm gonna have links for various accessories for the Canon R8 and also those other videos I talked about like the Canon Connect app. So do me a favor, if you could uh, hit that subscribe button, I'd really appreciate it and it'll keep you informed when I come out with new videos for the Canon R8 or the next Canon camera, for example. And also, if you can give me a thumbs up, really appreciate that as well. So. I will catch up with you guys next time. Thanks again for checking out my video and have a great day. Take care. <laughs>